Let's begin with our first story and the Deputy Minister of Energy, Joseph Kujo, says much progress has been made with plans to establish the Ghana National Petroleum Corporation's operational headquarters at Sekendi Takwadi in the western region. The move forms part of government's plan to create a regional oil hub. Mr. Kujo, who is in Norway as part of a petroleum commission delegation, explained a well-established oil city will contribute to making the country to making the country's oil sector grow. The industry is organized because the oil and gas industry requires services of a certain standard. And when it comes to schools, for example, you know, the workers in that space, the professionals in that space, would want a certain level of education for their kids when it comes to health services. The standard is also high. So it becomes economically beneficial for a country to organize the supporting and ancillary services, supporting the sector in a small space. That is the essence of getting the city where education for the industry players, uh, that is the kids and the families, and um, health delivery services and you create the environment which attracts the professionals from the world to stay in your country. If you don't do that, then these facilities get spread. Let's take Takradi for example. You would, see, you would notice an effect where every week people are flying from Accra to and fro, simply because these guys can spend the weekend in, Accra, uh, in Takradi. When it becomes like that, other countries may become more attractive just because, I'm talking about professionals, attracting the professionals into the sector, just because they get stressed accessing services as they work in the oil and gas sector. So it's, it's an imperative for us to develop a, an oil and gas city. Now it is a name for Takradi, but it is not in effect when you come to the services you can uh, get in support of the sector. That was Deputy Energy Minister Joseph Kujo speaking from Norway where the Petroleum Commission's trade mission is in its second day and my colleague Daryl Kwao has been engaging some emerging companies seeking to attract partnership. Well, as we have been reporting, this uh, trade mission is giving opportunity to some 40 Ghanaian businesses. We understand that they are emerging companies and startups to give them the opportunity to uh, foster partnerships and explore the market as far as the oil and gas sector is concerned. I'm here with Kofi Manfi on behalf of uh, Woodfields Energy. What do you do? Um, Woodfields is an oil trading company as well as an oil support services company. So we're here to learn from uh, people that have done this over 50 years. Um, you know Ghana is fairly young when it comes to the oil industry. We've been in for about just about 10 years. So we need the ne uh, necessary technical expertise to be able to um, capitalize on everything. And you know there's the local content as well. So when we learn from these people, we can also transfer this knowledge to our local people so that they can also be able to do this and um, increase employment and everything in the country. Okay. So tell me your name and what you do as well. Okay. My name is Eric Array and I'm with at Page Limited, we deal in heavy duty equipment material supply. So we just don't want to be at just the startup point. We want to grow. That's why we are here. We want to meet up with many people as possible. And with the help of Norweb and Eka Energy and other you know, potential energy, we want to really grow. That's why we are here. Okay. Well, speaking to the Petroleum Commission, one of the things they had to say is that they've got a list of many Ghanaian companies, but they are unable to sort of uh, attract investors or foster partnerships. Um, what do you think are the challenges that you experience that make it so difficult for some of you to sort of connect with uh, multinationals and get into business, if you like? Well, it has to do with um, the opportunity. So a platform like this um, opens up the opportunity for local companies like Woodfields and his company uh, to be able to network uh, with um, the right companies to be able to partner with them. For example, um, Woodfields has been 
in the industry for over 25 years now. We started off from the downstream, so we have the necessary expertise um, to be able to partner with the right fits, the right company, to be able to bring the necessary um, experience to um, the country. So what we are looking for right now is to partner people with the necessary technical experience who can actually train our people as well and um, be able to grow as a company. Okay, and, and you're dealing with uh, a financially driven and a technologically driven industry. Is that also a challenge? It's, uh, it's sometimes a challenge, uh, but uh, we as uh, the local company, we have our support, like we have our backends already. And uh, because we have proven beyond doubt that many of the financial institutions have, uh, like they back us and they have assured us in case we have a bigger uh, contract to do and we don't have the necessary or the needed equipment, they will supply us or they will give us uh, the back end, financial back end. So it won't be a problem when we chance on any uh, potential company. That was our qual reporting from Norway and moving on, the International Monetary Fund, IMF, says the over 8 billion cities spent on the seven collapsed banks will impact on the country's debt stock. This was after the Bank of Ghana noted that government's expenditure on the collapsed banks would not be added to the country's debt stock. There's more in the following report. Government has issued about 2.5 billion CDs in bonds to support GCB after it took good assets of UT on Capital Bank. About 5.8 billion have been spent in supporting the creation of the Consolidated Bank. The Bank of Ghana, together with government, had insisted that this expenditure would not affect the debt stock computation. But the IMF country director, Natalia Kuliadina, disagrees. Uh, this is government debt. Yes, therefore, it's going to be classified as uh, government debt. Uh, at the same time, these are one-off uh, costs which are necessary. So yes, these are the important measures that the government had to, uh, these are the important steps that the government had to take and it has taken it to make sure that uh, the cleanup of the banking sector continues and successfully for some industry experts, it is clear that the IMF has indeed been vindicated in terms of its recent forecast for the sector and what the regulator should have done to avert this challenge that has hit the banking space. Some fiscal policy stakeholders have called for a review of the tax incentive policy as it puts a burden on the national the nation's economy. The concerns were raised at a high-level dialogue on tax expenditures in Ghana, organized by the Economic Governance Platform in Accra. Uh, brought together oh, various players within the economic space to deliberate on the rising effects of tax expenditure on national growth and solutions to the problem. In 2017, tax expenditures alone accounted for 5.2% of the nation's GDP. Speaking on the sidelines of the dialogue, tax expert Abdullah Ali Nachian called for a review of tax policy incentives as they serve as guidelines for the various regulators. For 2018, for example, and look at the percentage of GDP that is going to certain expenditure line items like refunds 0.7 percent you take subsidies 0.1 percent and you have a tax expenditure of about 1.98 percent so if you had stemmed that revenue loss you can imagine what you could have done in terms of subsidies to the agri sector in terms of paying off certain government expenditure. So you can assess the grievousness from looking at the percentage of revenue lost through tax expenditures as against the percentage to GDP of certain expenditure lines. There are a lot of areas to look at because they are scattered in all the laws that we examine today. You have to examine the Income Tax Act. You have to look at the GIPC Act. You have to look at the Free Zones Act. You have to even look at the policy framework of the Ministry of Finance on tax exemptions and then you will be able to see what to be addressed. On his part, economist Dr. Eric Odorstein emphasized that the country loses so much revenue through incentive policies. If we don't review the incentive regime, it's going to affect us. Most importantly, the various mining and minerals agreements that we sign as a country, where we have stability clauses in there, takes all these incentive organizations outside the current legal regime. So it makes it difficult, again, 
for us to be able to mobilize it. So I will advocate that if we can pass what we call an unconscionable contract review amendment act, a law that sought to give the government the opportunity to review all such minerals and mining agreements or contracts, that seems to be very unconscionable because it has a stability clause arrangement in there that prevent government from reviewing it so that such in incentives can be mobilized to the benefit of Ghana to help us. We've been told that it is happening in Tanzania as a country, we can also do the same. You're still watching Business Live and we'll come back after this, we'll have a dialogue on the financial sector. You're still watching Business Live with me, Sandra Isenamafeno, and for our main story for tonight, and uh, Philip Namfuri has been engaged in a researcher with the New York University Center for e Technology and Economic Development, Kojo Ejapon Entry, to share um, some insights on his article, Perspectives on Banks' Effectiveness and Failures. Do the banks in Ghana, be it local or foreign, employ research modules, models, in lending and taking decisions when it comes to committing our deposits to customers? Um, that, that's quite difficult to answer. But from, from the little that I know, I think that our whole society is not friendly to research. It's not friendly to data analysis. It's more friendly to intuition. And so even for the banks that believe in research and have functional research department, you get to know that they don't really listen to their researchers. Banks are sitting on mountains of data. Virtually nobody analyzing this data. And even for those who do, are managerial decisions being influenced by these research-oriented approaches? I believe that if banks invest in relevant research, they are willing to listen to their researchers. They are willing to approach their management from a data-driven perspective. Then some of these issues could be averted. So it's, you have two options. You either approach management from a data-driven research perspective, or you approach it from an intuition-based perspective. Now, it's possible that you can use intuition to run a bank and create some success. But banking is highly complex. You cannot use your experience or your intuition alone. So I think that you know, it's one area that the banking industry, they need to really invest a lot more in, have a data-driven, research-capable approach to management. What do you think Ghana can learn from other economies in how to make our banking sector grow in the, on the right path, honestly, and merge it with other sectors so that we don't come back again to this crisis? Okay, so the question should, could be distilled into when it comes to other economies, how do they approach banking crisis? Remember, Ghana is not the only country to have experienced banking crisis, and this is not the first time we've experienced banking crisis. Other economies, the 2008 credit crunch was a major one. What reform did they undertake? And I keep telling people that there's this ideology that somehow the people who created this crisis, they were the wrong kind of people. And so some people believe that the simple approach is to get them out of the scene, bring a new set of people who do the right thing. And I tell them, look, people don't do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. People need to have the right incentives to do the right thing. You know, some people believe that somehow if they were the board chairman of one of these banks, they wouldn't get into these excess. They wouldn't lend to related parties. They wouldn't exceed their single obligor limit. And I tell them, the only reason you are thinking there is because you don't have the capacity to do that. The incentive in creating a conducive, stable financial services sector boils down to accountability. Let's now do our interview of the day and Energy Think Tank, Africa Center for Energy Policy says governments must keenly monitor the new endorsed contracts with oil company ACA to ensure the nation gets what is due from the contracts. Sheila Tamaklu has been engaging the executive director of the center, Ben Boachi, for his take in our interview of the day. The contract with Hess, you know, which is locked, I mean, which is signed, uh, it was signed in 2016, I guess. And um, that is not going to change. They have sold their interest in the block 
uh, to ACA. So it's the same fiscal terms, the same uh, uh, contractual conditions that they will have to satisfy, uh, uh, you know. But of course, you are dealing with two different companies, and um, uh, you just have to insist and ensure that the standards uh, that uh, operate in the sector is what is adhered to. Uh, by ACA, you know, because that's a new company. What is important to us as a country is for the, the, the agencies to monitor whoever is operating in, the, in, in, in our waters, you know, to uh, respond to our laws and uh, make sure that we can track production and get our share uh, of the resources. Yes, we know that when it comes to oil and gas, Norway is actually a big name in there. Do you think they'll be bringing something different on board? Um, I think um, for, for, for an industry watcher, I mean, it is always important that you have the capacity to monitor what is happening and not necessarily where the company is coming from, because these are commercial entities, uh, they are in to make money, uh, but it is an advantage to have a company coming from nowhere because there are you know, a lot of transparency requirements. You will know how the company perform uh, on the stocks. Everything is published, you know, and more transparent. And that gives, you know, advocates and uh, civil society the opportunity to get more data uh, to analyze what, you know, the company is reporting uh, uh, in Norway. But ultimately, the Ghana has a responsibility to make sure that it benefits uh, adequately uh, from the exploration and production of, the, of, of oil. So the heat is on in the build-up to the Joy Sports Invitation and Tournament, and some companies have actually been talking tough. Let's now hear from People's Pension. We have been in tournaments in the past, yes. we have won cups, yes. and we are coming to display for the first time with Joy Sports Invitational that we are a company to contend with. In fact, you can see for yourself. Be sure that when we come, we will seek your ground. Well, when we start a competition, we are always waiting for fun, but we want to win as well. So we are prepared. And coming su Sunday, Saturday, please come and see People's Pension Trust. We are going to surprise everybody. Thank you. Haven't you seen our team? They have trained me, Thank so I'm prepared. You. So coming Saturday, I'm going to score as well. We are prepared. So the companies have been talking tough, but when it comes to multimedia, um, Mo Salah for the multimedia group. So watch out, you know, you know how we've been doing it. But let's go to our online platform and see what's happening and meet the 38-year-old entrepreneur who built a $1 billion um, oil company in Ghana. That's on the um, front page of the website. And also when you go down Consolidated Bank of Loads, 1,700 workers, which was covered in our summaries. And also we have um, the currency market also there. And seven institutions shut down to operations at the port in protest against the city. And so do make a date with um, go on myjoinline.com um, to read the headlines on uh, what we have there. So that's all for um, Business Life tonight with me, Sandra, and I'm a I'll see you right here tomorrow. Have a great evening. <laughs>